This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. Coming up at 11, fans still stunned by Andrew Luck's surprise retirement. Some are critical, but the former quarterback is also getting plenty of support in his decision. Churches should be safe havens from violence, but we know that is not always the case. Ahead, keeping the faith by being prepared, but first and new at 11. When are we going to put the guns up? When are we going to come in the house, teach our children how to pray? In the exact spot where two teenagers were killed Friday morning, the community showing up in large numbers to support a grieving mother. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Nicole Griffin. An emotional vigil was held tonight at the Postbrook Apartments near 42nd and Post Road. The vigil held in memory of Ashlyn and Nicholas Nelson, a memorial created right outside of their apartment, as you see right here. And that is a place that was not easy for their mother to return to tonight. Family, friends, and community members stood side by side with candles and balloons showing their support for Antonia Bailey, the mother of Ashlyn and Nicholas. Tonight she wore a t-shirt with both of their photos on it and the date 8-23-2019. That is the date her children were taken from her. The crowd listened showing their support as Bailey spoke just a few words through her tears, thanking them for their love and support during the toughest time of her life. And tonight she has a message for the person responsible responsible for all this pain that she is feeling. My children were stolen from me. They were stolen from the world and they were they were amazing. They were I tried my hardest to protect them, but I couldn't. But they 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 are amazing. And to the individual who did it, please turn yourself in. If anyone sees him, please do not harm him. Call the police. I don't want any more violence. We don't need any more bloodshed. And I'm I'm mad as hell. I'm 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 mad, but I forgive you. I do. Community leaders who spoke tonight called on fathers to step up and be part of their children's lives and mentor our young men. Family members shared with the crowd that Ashlyn and Nicholas were good kids. They focused on their schoolwork and had big dreams, and they were always with caring adults. They asked the question tonight, where are our kids safe if they are not safe inside their own home? And tonight, police are still asking for your help finding the person of interest in this case. These are surveillance photos released shortly after the shooting of a person seen running away from that apartment complex. If you know where this person is tonight or who it is, contact Crime Stoppers, that number 317-262-TIPS. It has become an ever-present reality for Americans across the country. Active shooter situations are happening and the threat has remained constant in houses of worship. RTV6 reporter Graham Hunter found out what faith leaders are learning from law enforcement about how to be prepared. There's a conversation happening in faith communities around the country that deals less with faith. Some of us have said, well, you know, we're an easy target if somebody wanted to come in and make a statement. And more on what to do in case. What can we do to lessen the risk and protect ourselves and make our parishioners feel more secure? That's what brought Marlis and Terry Batima of Bethany Evangelical Lutheran Church out to an event sponsored by the nonprofit One Cop, where the IMPD, the Marion County Sheriff's Office, and FBI took turns educating the faithful about how to stay safe at their place of worship. So we want to make sure that all our congregations are prepared and that they have the information necessary that hopefully they never use. Presenters shared that just about 4% of all active shooter situations target houses of worship, a figure they say has held steady through the years. It's sad to say that you'd have to get security for a place of worship or a school where children are, but that's where we are. Bishop Charles Finnell is working to protect his congregants at Christ Temple Apostolic Church. One of the main things they emphasized is preventive. Uh, preventive actions. The presentation included characteristics to look for in potential attackers called pre-attack indicators, saying nearly all attackers engaged in prior threatening or concerning communications and exhibited behavior that caused concern in others. With the education, we're going to take some steps to, to try to first prevent anything from happening so we won't be reacting after the fact. Uh, God forbid that any of us be in that situation. And if that most awful of situations does occur, the educator said tonight, remember three words, avoid, deny, defend. Avoid the conflict if possible, deny entry to your location and look for another way out, and defend yourself if faced with an attacker. We just need to pray for our nation 
and pray that we have no more incidents like this and we won't have to have any more meetings like this. Working for you from the north side, Graham Hunter, RTV6. Graham, thank you. Tonight, Colts fans are facing a future with no luck. Many fans are upset that the star quarterback decided to retire, but some say they respect Luck's decision given the fact that he has dealt with injuries over the last few seasons. The news broke last night during the Colts' third preseason game against the Bears. Andrew Luck then addressed the media, confirming reports saying it all comes down to injuries, causing him to no longer enjoy the game of football like he once did. He says it is the best decision for himself and for the team to step away from the game of football. He says the decision is not an easy one. He loves his team and his teammates, but he knows he can't put his heart and soul into the position like the team deserves due to those injuries and the impact it's had on him personally. We talked to fans today who are still reacting to this news. You want to walk away when you can at the top of the game and after last year coming back and, and doing what he did after that shoulder surgery was pretty uh, pretty amazing and it's uh, the, I think the league's going to suffer from it. I was shocked. I was upset. I was because he's just so fun to watch. He's he's a great player. He's he's a great guy in general. It's disappointing. Obviously, uh, he needs to I think do what's best for him for his family. Um, but in my opinion, um, you know. I think that had this decision been made a few weeks or even a couple months prior, um, I think it might have been um, more well received. Luck said last night after his injury in 2016 that playing in pain, he made a vow to himself that he would not go down that path again. He says if it did happen again, he would essentially choose himself. And he says right now he is finding himself in a similar position. For the last four years or so, I've been in this cycle of injury, pain, rehab, injury, injury, pain, rehab. Uh, and it's been unceasing and relenting, unrelenting, both in season, both in and off season, uh, and I felt stuck in it. And the only way I see out uh, is, is to to no longer play football. Uh, it's it's taken my joy of this game away. Luck also says it has been the honor of a lifetime to represent the Horseshoe and the city of Indianapolis. He thanked the entire Colts organization, his teammates, and his family for the support during what he calls a very difficult time. The Colts organization, the NFL, and players are reacting to this news. The Colts official Twitter posting a photo saying, thank you, Andrew, a leader on the field, a pillar of the community. The NFL tweeted Luck stats, including Luck making it to the Pro Bowl four times and saying he was the 2018 Comeback Player of the Year. The tweet went on to say, congrats on an incredible career. And Colts tight end Eric Ebron tweeting, Andrew Luck will be somebody I tell my kids about, the person and the player. And finally, and new at 11, wide receiver T.Y. Hilton with this emotional tweet saying, every time I think about it, tears start to flow. No one understands you like I do. Our bond is one of a kind. I've decided to dedicate my season to the, my best friend. I love you 12 hashtag luck to Hilton and it is safe to say the entire Colts nation will truly miss seeing Andrew Luck on the field. Let's now get a check of your forecast with Storm Team 6 meteorologist Kyle Mount. And Nicole things are about to get a little bit soggy here in central Indiana tonight. Still fairly quiet on Storm Team 6 radar. We've had a couple of showers here in Montgomery County. Those are quickly fading though as they live north and east of I-74. You can see a little more substantial rainfall here moving into Bedford and southern portions of Jackson County now. Even had a few flashes of lightning with that, but not anticipating any severe weather. And our rain is still going to stay fairly scattered during the overnight, increase a little bit in coverage as we go to tomorrow morning. So make sure you got that umbrella ready to go. We'll have scattered showers in your Monday morning forecast with temperatures in the upper 60s. Kyle, thank you. Now to a traffic alert that could make your Monday morning commute a little brighter. After being closed for more than two weeks, the eastbound and northbound lanes of Interstate 465 are reopening on the southeast side between I-65 and I-70. This is a live look right now from our traffic camera. NDOT closed the lanes for maintenance, sign replacements, repairs, and cleaning. While crews have finished the round of construction work, I-465 southbound and westbound will close in the same area on September 6th and reopen on September 21st.
RTV6 is working for you and getting results. Drivers in Carmel reaching out to RTV6, thanking us for bringing their concerns to the city about visibility concerns at roundabouts. It is a story we first told you about last month. There were concerns about the tall grass and plants at this roundabout at Kinzer Avenue and East City Center Drive. Drivers say the plants made it difficult to see to pull out. Well, we visited that area today and reached out to Carmel. After our story, the street department sent crews out there to inspect the area, and now the plants have been cut much lower. A city spokesman says it will help with the line of sight for drivers, especially when it comes to seeing pedestrians. A week from today, the highly anticipated Indigo Red Line goes into full operation. Indigo is now conducting final practice runs along the entire 13-mile route. New road configurations and pavement markings have been in place since July 31st on College Avenue, Meridian Street, and Capitol Avenue. Indigo officials say since the Red Line is a service that is brand new to riders and bus drivers, they expect delays and occasional challenges for the first few weeks. They are asking everyone to be patient. And by the way, the full month of September is free for all Redline trips. Volunteers will be at stations to help answer any questions that you may have. Three people shot, two died, including a baby. Tonight, what we know about the woman accused of this shocking crime. And a city still trying to heal from a deadly mass shooting. How actor and comedian Dave Chappelle did his part to help uplift an entire community. Kyle. Our rain chances, they are pretty low for us tonight, but they ramp up quickly as we take you through your Monday forecast. We'll take an hour-by-hour -hour look at the rain chances and how much to expect. You're watching RTV6 News at 11. This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. New information in the deadly shooting of two people on the north side, one of them a three-month-old child. Last night, Metro Police arrested 36-year-old Ivory Smith. Investigators say earlier in the day, she shot three people at a home near 23rd and North Guilford. The victims included Smith's boyfriend, his mother, and his three-month-old nephew. The adult male and the child died at the scene. The mother was taken to the hospital in stable condition. Comedian Dave Chappelle reached out to the mayor of Dayton, Ohio after the August 4th shooting rampage that left nine dead and more than two dozen others injured. He asked what he could do to help the city and today he followed through. Here's ABC's Chuck Severson with a look at the fundraising event Chappelle hosted. Comedian Dave Chappelle is using his fame to help Dayton, Ohio, hosting a free concert Sunday to benefit victims and survivors of the August 4th rampage that left nine dead and more than two dozen injured. Dayton is strong. There was 120,000 of us here tonight. Chappelle grew up in Yellow Springs, Ohio, about 20 miles east of Dayton and still lives there. Immediately after the shooting, he reached out to the city's mayor asking how he could help. And the least we can do, Dave, is we have declared it Dave Chappelle Day in Dayton. The event, titled Gem City Shine, featured both local talent as well as entertainment from across the country. Concert goers were also able to donate to the Oregon District Business Association, which is helping local businesses recover. It's unfortunate how it came about, but I'm very excited to be here. It's good to be back home in the Gem City and have and show the support for our city. And everyone is being encouraged to shop at stores and dine at restaurants in the area. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News, New York. Metro police are looking for a hit-and-run driver who hit a motorcyclist on the east side. Officers were called to South Emerson and English Avenue just before 9 o'clock Saturday night. Witnesses told investigators the motorcyclist, a 30-year-old man, was going westbound on English Avenue when he ran the run line and was hit. Investigators are working to determine if he indeed did run that line. The motorcyclist was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police have not released any information on the suspect vehicle. He's known mostly for his iconic role as Mr. Sulu on the classic TV series Star Trek. And while that show was filled with drama and adventure, actor George Takei's personal life has seen its share of challenges. Today he visited the Children's Museum of Indianapolis and discussed his new book called They Called Us the Enemy. Takei shares the deeply personal and painful story of his family's time at an internment camp when he was a little boy during World War II. Thousands of Japanese families 
Japanese forced into the camp simply because the U.S. was at war against Japan. Takei says he wanted to make the book relevant to children by writing it in a style that would capture their attention. So that is why he wrote it as a comic book. So I thought that would be the way to reach young people today because they're going to be the voters of tomorrow, the movers and shakers of tomorrow. They are going to be the Americans of tomorrow with a fuller knowledge of American history, including this dark chapter of our history. While visiting the museum, Takei also took a tour of the new space object theater show called The Future Is Now, in which he did the voiceover narration. All right, Kyle. Well, we've had a nice weekend in the weather yeah, department. Yeah, beautiful. But unfortunately, that's changing. <laughs> yeah, right as we get ready to head back to work and the kids to school there on Monday morning, we're going to need to break out that rain gear, uh. the rain jacket, <laughs> the umbrella, the rain boots. Yeah, because it looks like things are going to be pretty wet as we go throughout our Monday here. Things are still quiet, though, right now. We're at 73 degrees in downtown Indianapolis. Kokomo, with some clearing, you've dipped back into the middle 60s already, 75 and mostly cloudy in Bloomington. And tonight, I think we'll find most communities with low temperatures holding in the middle 60s, about 66 in Indianapolis with that southeast breeze and a couple of showers. And you notice the big picture here on the satellite and radar. We've opened up that connection with the Gulf of Mexico. We've got rain that streams all the way here into the Ohio Valley. Again, we even had a few rumbles of thunder closer to the Ohio River this evening. But that area of rain is continuing to fade a little bit. We still have fairly dry air in place here across the Hoosier State. So until we get that humidity to rise a little bit, the rain is still going to be struggling. And you can see that moving into Bedford right now, trying to make its way into Jackson County. But we'll keep that rain coverage pretty limited as we go through the overnight. This is TrueCast by 5 o'clock in the morning. You can still see some scattered showers out there filling in from south to north here as we go through the morning and especially the middle of the day, your lunch hour. If you are going to be heading out, that's definitely when you're going to need that umbrella at noon. We've got widespread rain possibly a few rumbles of thunder here, although we're not expecting to have severe weather tomorrow. Really, it's going to be more about some isolated storms and some heavier pockets of rainfall that will continue through the evening rush hour and then tapers off to a few scattered showers as we head into our Monday evening and Tuesday. As far as rainfall, though, a pretty good soaking coming our way here. Many areas we're talking about an inch to two inches of rainfall between Monday and lingering with that rain chance into Tuesday. But because of the clouds and rain on Monday. It's going to be a little cooler. Temperatures only around 70 degrees at noon. We'll get into the middle 70s for that afternoon high. And when you consider our average high is 84, we're off the mark by about 10 to 15 degrees tomorrow afternoon with a high of 71 in Noblesville, 74 in Bloomington, and 75 in Lafayette. Again, we are going to carry that rain chance at least into the first half of our Tuesday here before we start to dry things out. And once again, that will keep our temperatures a little below average for this time of year. And that's really going to be the theme over the next seven days of your forecast. Highs around 80 degrees here after tomorrow's high of 74, but at least we'll dry things out Wednesday into the end of the week. Small chance for some rain looking ahead to next weekend, but August can be hot. We don't have any heat in that forecast. And we've been lucky on our days off with good weather, but now it's going to rain. <laughs> a little soggy tomorrow for sure. Yeah. All right, Kyle, thank you. Well, Andrew Luck spent almost seven years with, Indi with the Indianapolis Colts, and now that he's retiring, we're looking at the legacy he's built. That is coming up next when the news at 11 continues. Store, Ashley Home Store. This is home. Andrew Luck's surprise retirement means we have to start looking ahead to a future without him. But tonight, our day first takes stock of his impact on the team and the community. It was 2012, in the midst of the city celebrating a Super Bowl, and the house that Peyton built was an opportunity to sit down with then Stanford quarterback Andrew Luck. He refused to get too in-depth about possibly replacing the Hall of Famer, but it was clear the baton was passed. The hope was that it would be for many, many years to come. After the Colts drafted him number one in New York, Andrew was all in. Helped the team win 11 games his rookie season, the most of any quarterback drafted number one overall. He also threw for more yards than any rookie in NFL history. 
His next two seasons brought back familiar feelings from the Manning era. After another 11-win season, Locke and the Colts were back in Foxborough, dealing with the Patriots in the divisional playoffs. In 2014, it was another 11-win season while leading the league in touchdown passes before a trip to the AFC title game. Unlike Peyton, Andrews Colts were never able to solve the riddle that is New England football. Off the field, Andrew was just as impactful. The central figure of Riley Children's Health's Change the Play program. Andrew preached the importance of activity of young people, even through one of his legendary passes to perhaps the game's next generation. But his own health became the center of attention. Over the years, he suffered rib and kidney injuries, a torn labrum in his throwing shoulder, and most recently, a strained left calf, leading to other ailments. He was able to make a triumphant return just last year and help guide the Colts to another divisional round playoff game. He was named the comeback player of the year that season. It turned out to be his last. Luck leaves as he arrived on his own terms. His only goal now, get 100% healthy for his future and for his family. Day first, RTV6. My wife, Nicole. Of select 2019 Cherokee models at dealer stock. RTV6 scopes out opportunities for all ages, but this month Hiring Hoosiers is highlighting students transitioning from the classroom to their career. Our Alyssa Donovan gets the scoop on BDTV at the Area 31 Career Center at Ben Davis High School. Karen Simmer worked on this video before graduating earlier this year. I'll talk to people that have also graduated this year and I can show them some of my work and they said, wow, I wish I had this kind of opportunity in high school. He sat in the same classroom as these students who are receiving hands-on experience in television production, an education that will lead to major opportunities. The internship I had this summer was offered to um, college juniors or seniors. So the, the skills that I've learned here are so high and are usually attained by people that are much, much older than me. Like many BDTV grads that came before him, Simmer is continuing his education. He starts at Ball State this year, where he'll work a video job while pursuing a degree in telecommunications. We still need to work on our newscast. Instructor Dennis Goins, who spent years working as a news and sports photographer, has been sharing his experience with students for nearly 20 years. Well, the challenge for me is to take that student to make them understand how serious this is. We treat it not like any other class. It is a production facility. Students learn camera operations, news writing, editing, field and studio production. All of the elements it takes to create a professional newscast, like this one featuring BDTV alum and RTV6 weekend anchor, Nicole Griffin. Our students are working in just about every TV station here in Indianapolis. We have students that are working in film production all over the world. And because of the years that we've been here and the success that we've had, we want to continue the legacy of greatness. A legacy that's well known by students who feel fortunate to be part of the program. There's something special about BDTV that you can't get really anywhere else in the country. Working for you, Alyssa Donovan, RTV6. Alyssa, thank you. Dennis Goins, the instructor, is also a former RTV6 photographer. You can find this story and others like it at HiringHoosiers.com. And Mr. Goins, Kyle, was my all-time favorite teacher. That program yeah. really brought me to where I and am now. And look at the places you can go, exactly, right? Such a good program. Those old photos, though, not so good. Yeah, well, as kids are heading back to school, I, we can work on bringing that <laughs> hair back, right? As kids are heading off to school tomorrow, we've got some shower and thunderstorm chances, so really a pretty good day to be indoors. We'll have temperatures stuck in the 70s, about an inch to two inches of rain here over the next couple of days before we dry it out. All right, Kyle, thank right. you, and thank you for joining us. Have a great night.